Let's move on to some of the candidates then. Obviously, the standout candidate everyone's talking about appears to be Ruben Amarim over at Sport in Lisbon. But I noticed you brought another name to the fore, and he's not a name a million miles away from the fame either. It's Julian Nagelsmann. I want to spend a bit of time talking about him and the possibility or the prospect of him being the guy. Um, he felt like a little bit of an afterthought to me somewhat, and I guess that's on the back of his stock falling prior to his Bayern Munich time, of course. But did he get a bit of a raw deal on the back of that? And obviously, Thomas Tuchel's tenure now, we know that coming to an end and he's not exactly flavour of the month there so I guess the Bayern Munich job isn't quite as straightforward as people made out No it's a very political job as we know and I actually said when Jurgen Klopp announced that he was going to go the first name that I raised was Nagelsmann because I've always believed he is a very special coach you've got to bear in mind this is a guy that got the Hoffenheim job at the age of 28 youngest ever Bundesliga coach. He'd already done some impressive things at under-19 level with Hoffenheim. And he walked into a relegation battle with a lot of guys in the squad who were older than him or his age. And he was able to not only deal with some of the big characters in that squad, but he actually seemed to seek out some of those big characters um, in further seasons. And he still gets on really well uh, with Zandro Wagner who uh, is absolutely a guy who doesn't pull any punches. And he's one of his assistants with Germany now. So you could see very early on, this was a guy tactically who was very good, but also was a good man manager. And he not only got Hoffenheim out of relegation danger, he then went on to take them into the Champions League twice. Once Liverpool knocked them out in the playoffs that you'll remember. And the other time they went straight into the group stage. And yes, they struggled in the group stage, but it's Hoffenheim. Of course, they're going to struggle in the group stage. So I think he did incredible things there. You look at his work with RB Leipzig, um, regularly qualified for the Champions League, got into the Champions League semifinals uh, one season. Uh, That was back in 2020 in the COVID era. Mm. And so that tempted Bayern to spend a huge amount of money to bring him in. And... uh, The first season, he won the league, as he was expected to win the league, of course. Uh, They went out of the Champions League to Villarreal, but it was close. And Villarreal gave Liverpool a run for their money in the semi-finals that season. So even though that was seen as a a really big misstep, I don't think it's a huge disgrace. It's the kind of thing that can happen against an Unai Emery team. And they only went out courtesy of a very late goal. So I think then he became a convenient scapegoat. And I think it's no surprise that the guys who I believe got rid of him to save themselves, uh, Oliver Kahn and Hassan Salahamidzic, they're no longer at the football club. And what's even more instructive, I believe, is that there's been talk of Bayern approaching him to come back. So I think maybe there is an acceptance at the club that they made a misstep um, in getting rid of him too quickly. With Germany, he's had a bit of a renaissance in the last international break because, of course, they managed to get wins over France and the Netherlands, um, which was hugely impressive. I can't remember a more transformational international break. So he's a guy who's learned a lot, I think, from what happened to Bayern. Very smart tactically. Gets a bit of a rough deal in terms of people thinking he's not a good man manager. I don't believe that. I I think he is. I, I think he's proven that time and time again. And actually, when he left Bayern... The narrative that got pushed was that he'd lost the dressing room. And actually, guys like Jozo Kimmich and Leon Goretzka came out and said, that's simply not the case. You know, we we, we enjoyed working with him and we'd enjoy working with him again. So uh, I I think he his is a name that should probably have a bit more respect put on it. In terms of whether he would be available, he's been very coy. He's been very keen to keep his options open. The DFB have talked about getting around the table and maybe agreeing a new deal beyond Mm. the Euros. And he has said, well, depends what the offer is. And he's also said, if a really interesting club job came on my desk, you know, that's something I might be willing to agree before the Euros even start. So I do think it's a live option. And I've heard that Liverpool might be interested. Yeah, no, likewise as well. Like I say, he's not a million miles removed from this conversation. Whoever has it, really, he always seems to be in and around it. But as I mentioned at the top, he does appear to be sort of a bit of an afterthought in the monks. And whether that is because he's currently employed by Germany and obviously the timeline doesn't quite work, but we've seen people be able to bend and flex for international management before. So it's not out of the realms of possibility for me. And he'd be one of the 
the the more likely candidate in my mind because he fits that age profile as well that Liverpool appear to be going after. Obviously, Xabi Alonso, Ruben Amarine, likewise, and Nagelsmann too, that up-and-coming next big thing type manager. So it's a really, really interesting one for me. Just on him bit more in a bit more detail and you mentioned tactically he's really astute and stuff like that but in terms of the tactics he does employ and the way the brand of football the style he likes his teams to play how would you describe that yeah well it can be very attacking um you know they scored a lot of goals under him Bayern and he's not wedded to one particular way of playing you know he can operate with a three he can operate with a four at the back he's kind of flitted between those at times he's somebody that does like to create overloads, does like to kind of have lots of options in what he calls the red zone, which is kind of in front of the, uh, on the edge of the penalty area. And he played in two different ways last season with Bayern. The way they started was to have a fluid front four, which included Sadio Mane, actually, you know, and they were rotating. And I thought if they'd seen that through, that could have been very exciting for them. And I think last season would have ended up being a lot better but there was this big debate after Lewandowski went that they needed a centre forward. And he kind of, not quite acquiesced, but I think he was conscious of that debate. They had a run of four straight draws, I think. And so they started playing Eric Maxim Choupo-Moting as a centre forward. And he did very well. He scored lots of goals. So he, he is pragmatic in the sense that he will change things. He will look at the opposition um, and he's not wedded to one particular way of playing. So I think he he's a very, very competent tactical mind, very important with the counter press. He's really, really conscious of that. He, he talks about that a lot. That chimes with what Jurgen Klopp has done at Liverpool, of course. You lose that ball, you've got to go and win it back as quickly as possible, and you've got to try and win it high. So he does get a lot out of good attacking players. He does play aggressive attacking football uh, and I I think Liverpool fans having seen his football would probably take to him yeah no I tend to agree with that as well and obviously being in the, the Red Bull model which isn't a million miles away from what FSG sort of go about how they go about their business and stuff like that certainly in the transfer market and recruitment strategies so yeah it does feel like a fit that would make some sense and um, just in terms of his personality then you mentioned it a moment ago obviously following on from Jürgen Klopp who as we know is very much one of a kind and the pitch much irreplaceable I mean in terms of his character in terms of his characteristics do you think there's a fit there and also the fact that it is following on from Jürgen Klopp you mentioned right at the top about how Xavi Alonso might have looked at that and gone, oh, that's a that's a daunting prospect. Is Nagelsmann the type to sort of shirk that challenge or do you think he'd just embrace it head on? I think he'd embrace it head on. Um, he's a guy that, I mean, look at the Germany situation. You know, it's quite unusual for a guy of his age to be willing to take that on. Uh, you know, a country with tens of millions of potential managers. So, you know, you know that you're competing against all of those views. You know, he took on Bayern. He was happy to that. Happy to do that. He didn't stay in the kind of comfort blanket of Leipzig. He was happy to make that move, and he's just a guy who has a real force of personality that can cause problems sometimes. In the sense that he's probably a bit too honest sometimes. I think you learned that at Bayern. He's very outspoken about things. He just loves to talk about football, really, in a similar way to the way Jurgen Klopp does, really. So I think sometimes that gets him into trouble. But I, I like him very much. And, you know, he said very early on in his career that he feels that football management is 30% tactics and 70% social competence. You know, it's about being able to get the best out of these players. I mean, I remember one of the examples when he was at Hoffenheim was that they had these Hoffenheims run by a software billionaire. So they're always at the forefront of all the new tech. And one of the things they had was this kind of um, drone footage. And what they used to be able to do was stop a training session. And they had these massive screens up at the training ground. And he said, right, we'll, we'll stop it. Look at this that we've just played. You should be here. You should be here. All that stuff. Yeah. He said to the players, if you do X, Y, Z, I'll let you play FIFA on the big screen. And we'll hook up, you know, a PlayStation or whatever it happened to be. Uh, and he said, that's what we'll do. I know it's only a small thing, but... I think as well, because he's young, he's a bit closer in age to these guys and he kind of understands them a bit more. You know, they listen to some of the same music, you know, watch some of the same stuff. So I think that it's not the be all and end all. And it doesn't mean Jurgen Klopp can't, you know, identify with his players or what have you. But having those touch points, having those references, I don't think does any harm. 
No, there's definitely relatability there as well. And I just remembered now when you were talking, that you got a little bit of, it's criticism, the fair words, in the media, because you used to go on a skateboard to train and stuff like that. I remember that being yeah. a thing. Yeah, well, that that was in the middle of that run of four draws. And, what okay. ha- and I think that took, he was a bit taken aback by that because I think what happened was he got criticised for everything. He's too young. He doesn't wear the right stuff. He doesn't look like a coach. He skateboards. You know, he, he likes being on a motorbike, things like that. He got loads of criticism for him, not his coaching, not his leadership. For, it was about him. Mm. And that's just buying. You know, Bayern is an enormous deal in Germany. You know, whatever happens at Bayern, that will be national news. So I think that taught him a lot, but also hurt him a fair bit. And I think now with those tools, I think there's no challenge. I think he would believe was too big. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And you mentioned the off and on training ground now. I spent a couple of days there filming for our Bobby Firmino documentary and got to see the screens you're talking about. And they're very much at the forefront of that sort of technology uh, yeah. in, innovation. So, like, there was something inside the training ground as well that essentially popped out lights and a ball would pop out and you'd have to kick it back into a different one. It was really interesting. We got to have a go with it. Oh, it just... yeah. That's the version. It's called like the footbanor, I think. That's yeah, kind that's of right. Kind of... Yeah. 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 It's all yeah, about yeah, the yeah. mind and how you respond to certain triggers and stuff like that. It was really interesting. But again, that sort of ties in nicely to the way people think about We often get like brain neurologists in and stuff like that to sort of plan ahead yeah, and sure. get that extra Absolutely. bit of percentage. So, he's, he's used to that sort of environment as well. Yeah, the goalkeepers at Hoffenheim, I mean, I imagine this is more widespread now, but the goalkeepers at Hoffenheim used to have these glasses that had strobe lighting and that would improve their uh, reaction times. Um, So, yeah, and I can see why a guy like that, and I know it's been briefed that he's unlikely to be on the list. That's slightly contrary to a couple of the things I've heard, but you never know with these things. They're very fast moving. You never quite know if briefings are accurate and what have you. But if I didn't know anything, you know, you'd say that a data driven approach, if his name didn't come up, it's probably not the right data driven approach. So, you know, I would think a guy like that would absolutely come up. 